All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the Innovation Business and Law Center's Fall Speaker Series. I'm Jason Rantanen, professor at the University of Iowa College of Law and director of the Iowa Innovation Business and Law Center. Today we welcome professors uh, Anna Santos Rutschman and uh, Rakaya Yearby from the St. Louis University School of Law. Professor Rutschman researches and writes in the areas of health law, intellectual property, and law and technology. And she's recently focused on issues relating to vaccines, healthcare blockchain, and artificial intelligence in medicine. And she's a member of the American Society for Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Professor Yearby specializes in racial disparities in healthcare, the political economy of healthcare, and social justice in medical research, drawing upon empirical data to explore inequities in the healthcare delivery system. She's the executive director and co-founder of the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity. Their talk today is entitled The Exclusionary Clockwork, Mapping Structural Racism in the Intellectual Property Ecosystem. So I'm now gonna turn it over to professors uh, Rutschman and Yearby. We'll talk for about 30 minutes. After that, we'll have time for questions and further discussion. So welcome to Iowa Law. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna start sharing our slides. And then I'm turning it over uh, to Professor Rutschman. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for having us um, today. We're delighted um, to be um, here. I have no control over the pace of the, um, of the slides today. So if um, Professor Yearby, you could get us to the next um, um, slide. All right, so I'm going to start us off by one explaining a little bit of the title and the uh, approach the, that we are taking today. So a little bit of, um, uh, of a roadmap and then I'll turn it to Professor Yearby um, to discuss some of the concepts we're um, going to explore a little bit today. So our talk is um, entitled The Exclusionary um, Clockwork, which is um, sort of a, of a play uh, on um, the uh, ability of a patent holder or an IP um, older um, to exclude others from the marketplace for a period of time. Um, that's in broad strokes what IP is designed to do, but we are going to look at some of the unintended or some of the things that could be expected from um, the IP system, but that's not what it was designed um, to do and the ways in which it sometimes misfunctions, we think, um, and the implications of some of those misfunctions um, uh, from uh, a perspective of excluding a certain um, type um, of uh, populations. Um, this is not the only type of exclusion um, that uh, we um, have uh, found both in our work and the IP and health law communities um, at large that we have found uh, in the ways that um, IP works, but we are going to um, take uh, the angle of um, structural racism uh, and Professor Irby will tell us uh, more about that in just, um, in just a second. Um, so we, we are going to talk about structural racism. We're going to talk about the um, ways in which uh, intellectual property, and today we're going to be focusing on, on patents um, in which um, it, um, it um, results uh, in the exclusion uh, of uh, certain populations accessing life, potentially life-saving um, goods. In doing so, we're going to talk about the interplay between intellectual property and innovation processes because IP is often seen as the default way of incentivizing uh, innovation. So we're going to be talking uh, about that, but also tying IP to other um, structures of innovations, um, institutional players, uh, regulatory um, standards and structures, for instance, the co-involvement of FDA and other regulatory standards in areas like um, drug uh, regulation and the production of new medicines. And finally, we are going um, to um, nod to possible solutions to some of the problems we're diagnosing, uh, and we'll attempt to bring a justice and equity framework um, into uh, or more of a justice and equity framework into the, into the IP field. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Irby, who will talk about structural racism and what we mean in this particular context. So when we talk about structural racism, we are referring to the ways that laws are used to structure our systems, including healthcare um, and the intellectual property ecosystem. 
Um, and what it does is it advantages dominant groups and disadvantaged racial and ethnic minorities. We see this as a continuing racial hierarchy uh, within the US. Um, it also includes the ways that organizations and institutions work together to create standards and policies that benefit them. Um, and we're going to talk about this, um, particularly in terms of intellectual, uh, the intellectual property ecosystem today. One thing I do want to highlight is that traditionally when we think about racism under the law, we think about it in the limited context of interpersonal, which is disparate treatment, as well as disparate impact, which is traditionally institutional discrimination or racism. Structural racism goes beyond that to really look at the ways that law um, harms racial and ethnic minorities while at the same time benefiting uh, the dominant group. And so we're gonna give you uh, further examples later on. Um, all right, so um, having um, had that um, bit of a framing, um, I'll just explain what we mean by the intellectual property ecosystem and what we will be focusing on um, today. Um, so we're going to be uh, using the word um, exclusionary in a different way that it's normally used um, in, um, in IP thinking. So we're not going to be talking about the things that IP is supposed to do in terms of excluding others uh, from the market. We are going to be uh, mapping um, forms of exclusion, race bias at this uh, point, uh, exclusion um, that are enabled by IP, but that's not what the system was designed to do. We call it the exclusionary clockwork because facially intellectual property in many of the instances that we're going to be talking about today is doing exactly what it's supposed um, to be doing. It's giving the patent um, holder uh, a certain uh, number of rights and by exercising that uh, bundle, um, they get to compete under certain uh, conditions that we think collectively are necessary to incentivize um, innovation. The problem is that by having this as sort of the blanket approach, the blanket IP approach to um, uh, innovation, particularly in um, areas like the ones we are going to survey um, today, uh, which involve pharmaceuticals, biologics, uh, et cetera, uh, we um, are uh, attempting to flesh out the features, um, the structural features of the patent system um, that work as a contributing um, root of structural racism as defined by Professor um, Irby. So today, we are going to be mapping uh, a few embodiments of uh, patent enabled um, structural um, racism. We don't mean to um, offer um, today a comprehensive uh, view, but we think the examples we bring um, to you today are pretty representative um, of the overall um, structural ways in which uh, we enable um, racism uh, through um, the grant of IP rights. Um, and we are going to be focus, uh, focusing on a particular um, set of um, case studies relative to the biopharmaceutical um, industry. I think with um, COVID going on and uh, the pandemic, um, I think it's easy to understand why we've decided um, to uh, focus on a set of examples that relate to health um, and to access to potentially life-saving or ameliorating um, goods as opposed to other goods that are uh, valuable, but we chose not to focus on such as um, cell phones or um, aviation um, components, for instance. So that, that's um, sort of the framework we'll be uh, operating um, under um, today. Uh, and if I could have the next slide, please. All right. Um, so um, as Professor Yerby um, has um, uh, already uh, mentioned, um, we um, take a particular view of the manifestations of structural uh, racism and intellectual property. And one of the things we uh, want to highlight from the get-go is that, uh, of course, IP was designed as a race-neutral system and operates as a race-neutral um, system. So we're not saying that um, these are often or, or most of the time conscious decisions that are uh, being made, but we are becoming aware of manifestations of structural um, racism that uh, tend to either nominally benefit uh, innovation processes as we tend to conceive of them from a majority uh, perspective or even majority uh, poor populations while harming uh, racial and ethnic uh, minorities. So in the work we've been developing for the past couple of years, Professor Yervi and I have been looking at, again, IP and it, its intersection with institutional players, regulatory um, 
landscapes, which again, sometimes might come from the FDA field or adjacent fields, not um, necessarily just from your traditional IP regulators um, and players, but everything intersects um, in, in areas um, like um, the ones involving access um, to medicines. And we think that it's important in addition to looking at just IP rules and um, norms and practices to also look at what the market looks like. So the market configuration, the business models that are adjacent to and overlapping with IP practices and the IP culture and corporate corporate structures. So we're going to um, nod um, uh, at all of these uh, uh, things. Uh, we'll start by presenting uh, a, a case study um, that's more on the IP structural side of things, but we'll nod at all these factors because all, we think all of this is contributing um, to the problems that uh, we observe right now. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so this is our to-do list, sort of our approach. Um, so far there's, there's been, we think, um, mostly a tip of the iceberg, iceberg um, approach. Um, we'll use it uh, just to illustrate this point, examples from um, non-patent areas of, um, uh, of IP. Um, just in 2020 uh, alone, and I know there's already been presentations uh, involving um, these topics during this wonderful um, series that Iola is putting um, together. But we've had the case of um, several brands range, ranging from um, uh, formerly um, Uncle Ben's to uh, uh, trademarks with, um, with the Washington-based uh, football team, which were renamed, right? They were renamed, and that's what, what we mean, um, the tip of the iceberg approach. We are not targeting um, the root of the problem. We are um, targeting one of its many manifestations. Um, and while this is uh, important and uh, we think um, desirable that we intervene as soon as uh, possible, we're going to really focus uh, on targeting the enabling mechanisms of structural racism, again today from a patent law and policy perspective as applied to pharmaceutical products. And then if I could have the next slide, please. Um, we are going to, again, be focusing on the non-utilitarian aspects of rights-based um, forms um, of exclusion. So we recognize that intellectual property plays an important role um, and is a desirable um, um, tool and lever um, in innovation um, policy. And if I could have the next slide, I would tie that to our um, claims. And one, uh, I think... I think you went up to um, Rukaya. Could you could we go one backwards, please? Um, so uh, we are going to present um, three claims that again do not relate um, to the utilitarian function of the intellectual property system as a catalyst for innovator, but rather to side effects uh, um, we have um, detected. And we're going to make three uh, claims. So while performing its um, utilitarian function, which is by and large, what the patent system was uh, designed to do, uh, the patent system is enabling um, structural racism and perpetuating uh, racial um, um, exclusion under many guises, um, we think by doing three things. The first one, and that's where we'll spend most of the time today, actually, uh, we claim that the patent system structure both causes to some extent and then replicates and reinforces and amplifies racial um, inequalities. And Professor um, Yerby will present immediately after this, uh, the beginning of a case study um, illustrating this topic. And then to round up our analysis, we'll also end at the two other claims we are uh, making in this larger paper we're working on. So the second one is that in some um, areas, uh, and again, particularly um, areas uh, of IP that relate to the development um, and access to development of and access um, to health goods, um, the way the patent system intersects with FDA regulation, um, antitrust, and a few other um, heavily regulated uh, areas compound structural uh, racism as well. And finally, the patent um, system as it is currently structured reinforces racial disparities uh, in corporate um, structures and uh, representative representativity issues um, are uh, also a way of reinforcing um, the chain uh, of structural racism that uh, we're identifying in this um, in this field. So we're going to now turn to number one to claim number one and we're going to start uh, with um, um, an example of a replica and amplification of um, structural racism through the patent system. 
Um, so our first argument um, is that uh, commercial exclusion driven by utilitarian um, principles exacerbates um, other forms of um, exclusion or disproportionately or unduly burdens access to patent protected um, health goods, welfare um, enhance, enhancing um, goods. So in, in incentivizing or attempting to uh, facially incentivize uh, innovation, in fact, um, the patent um, system um, is going to create side uh, forms uh, of uh, or adjacent forms of uh, exclusion uh, and our argument number two uh, is that that exclusion and the burden posed by that exclusion falls disproportionately on racial uh, minorities so i'll turn to professor yearby now for an illustration of these two arguments related um, to a certain type of health goods thank you so when we think about this, uh, we're going to use the example of rates of persons living with HIV, the overall rates and how it disproportionately impacts racial and ethnic minorities. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about how this is an example of structural racism and connected with the intellectual property ecosystem. So when we look at the overall rates of HIV, uh, we could see that there are predominantly higher rates um, in the South and many of the areas in Florida. Um, sorry, my slides are jumping. Um, and then we will filter it uh, by race. Um, so we see differences um, in where these infections are based on race. And so here's an example of the rates uh, within whites filtered by Blacks. And again, you can see a higher rate in Florida um, compared to the rates of whites. Um, and then we can see the rates uh, for Latinos. Um, again, uh, concentrated in some of the Southern states, but also we can see um, a disproportionate rate um, in Massachusetts. So when we look at new HIV diagnosis, we see, as I mentioned, the increased rates in the southern states, um, the western states, um, and then uh, northeastern and Midwest states. Black people, non-Hispanic, represent 12% of, of the US population, but accounted for 43% of the new HIV diagnosis. Uh, why is this important? Because when we look at the availability of HIV drugs and medicines, uh, many uh, Black people and Latinos do not have access. And this really came to the forefront in the 1990s uh, and shifted <clears throat> our focus on who was participating in medical research, clinical trials. Um, and there we moved from shifting from protection to inclusion. So before the 1990s, we have put in place protection methods um, to prevent the exploitation, uh, the overuse of Black and Latinos, racial and ethnic minorities, and other groups in medical research because they were participating in studies um, that did not provide a benefit uh, and just really were being used because they were easily accessible. However, when the HIV AIDS epidemic happened, many of these groups protested um, to try to be included in medical research studies because of the belief that this was the only way that they could gain access to these medicines. Um, as a result, the NIH, FDA changed its policies, really trying to promote and require the inclusion of African Americans, Latinos, women, and other marginalized groups into medical research as a way to increase access to medicine rather than fixing the structural problems related to inaccessible, inaccessible or lack of access to these medicines. And we see this continuing on. And so how is this an issue of structural racism? We see the laws being changed 
at the wrong point, right? The laws being changed in terms of increasing access to participation and medical research, rather than changing the laws and the structures in terms of access to medicines, in terms of how the patent system uh, is actually being used uh, to increase access to the medicines once they are developed. And so I'm gonna shift it back over to Professor Russia. Okay, so I'm going to connect the uh, points that Professor um, Irby just uh, made about um, the HIV epidemic, um, because that's the current status of HIV in, in the US. It's an epidemic uh, and has been for many, many years, except that we now have um, the drugs we need um, to prevent um, and to manage uh, HIV in infection. But we're going to focus specifically on the prevention of uh, HIV infection, and uh, we're going to follow the course of a patent-protected um, drug, um, so it's a prophylactic, an HIV um, prophylactic, um, that's uh, known as Truvada for PrEP. Um, so we're not going to be talking uh, about all types of um, HIV uh, medication, but a particularly uh, relevant one from a public health intervention um, perspective because this um, patented drug does have the ability to curb some of the rates of infection that you saw uh, in um, the prior slides. So we're going to accompany the trajectory of this uh, patent protected um, um, drug. Um, and although there's an intellectual property um, story there, we're going to attempt to connect um, that um, story um, to the colors in the maps that you saw um, just now. So we have a drug that's developed in the um, 21st century that basically um, is uh, universally acknowledged as a drug that really has um, the ability to curb the rights of um, HIV infection. So the best possible uh, form of public health intervention, a preventative uh, one for uh, an epidemic. Um, we know that there's around 1.2 million um, people indicated uh, for this preventative um, therapy in um, the United States, numbers coming from um, CDC. Um, but we know that of this um, number of people, only 167,000 are actual uh, taking um, Truvada for uh, uh, PrEP, so this particular drug. Um, the reason, which uh, has now been documented in multiple uh, venues, but uh, most notably um, the HIV Plus magazine, is the cost. Um, so the drug is too expensive uh, for most of the indicated population to be able to access it. And if I could get the next slide, please. Um, all right, so how did we get to this point? Um, here's the history be uh, behind, uh, behind Truvada for uh, PrEP. Um, this was actually a drug that was developed in partnership between the public sector, universities, and um, the private sector. So Gilead being the company that eventually uh, brought um, the drug um, to market. It had worked with uh, NIH, the Gates Foundation, um, Emory University also involved in the research and development of this drug, but eventually the significant patents uh, were obtained by Gilead. Now in 2004, um, FDA approved um, Truvada for PrEP um, to be administered in, in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Truvada to be um, administered in the United States and um, eight years later, um, it approved it uh, for this um, pre-exposure prophylaxis that we've been talking about. So first, um, the non-prophylactic version of the drug and then um, the PrEP version of the drug that's of interest to us um, today. So we have, uh, again, the intellectual property system uh, as a catalyst um, to innovation. We have Gilead um, having the significant patents here, although there are some IP disputes uh, that we're not going to um, dwell on as much today. Uh, but we have a private sector company that has benefited from uh, research performed um, elsewhere uh, and funding coming uh, from the public sector, including a few other sources. Um, and we have this company uh, developing two versions of the drug, one uh, having a significant public health benefits from a preventative perspective, and that one um, is okayed by the FDA in 2012. Could I please get the next slide? Um, 
except that even though the drug was uh, available and cleared by the FDA, Gilead decided not to promote Truvada for PrEP, so the prophylactic version of the drug. So even though the, the numbers of HIV infection were uh, and are uh, at an epidemic level, the company made the decision not um, to promote it uh, actively um, for uh, PR-related um, reasons. Um, except that the drug is really uh, effective in accomplishing uh, what it's uh, designed to do. Um, so word of mouth um, spread um, and uh, the relevant communities were very active um, in um, promoting the drug themselves. So by 2016, realizing the commercial potential of the drug, Gilead started promoting um, the drug uh, for PrEP. Uh, if I could get the next slide, please. All right, with uh, an increased uh, commercial exposure of the drug came an increase um, in price. So when FDA first approved um, Truvada, so no PrEP function here, um, the drug costs around $650 to a US patient, to your average um, US patient. 2012, so that's when PrEP uh, comes um, to market. It's just over $100,000. Eleven hundred dollars. Uh, Twenty eighteen, when um, Truvada for Pep becomes a legitimately a bestseller, uh, sixteen hundred dollars. Twenty nineteen, um, seventeen fifty. So the numbers escalating pretty um, pretty quickly once the company makes the decision um, to take advantage of its patent enabled market position um, and commercialize the drug uh, and promote it uh, widely. If I could get the next slide, please. Um, and this is where uh, we stand today, um, Truvada for PrEP um, um, being a, a very important component of the revenue uh, generated um, uh, by Truvada for um, Gilead. So 2.3 out of 3.5 um, yearly um, billion dollars coming um, through um, this um, drug, which uh, again um, can uh, have a, a tremendous impact in curbing um, the HIV epidemic. If I could get the next slide, please. All right. Um, now, I've mentioned already the patents um, in existence, and I'm happy to take questions on the Q&A because we're not telling the story so much from a prop, intellectual property centric uh, angle, but more the adjacent features of um, IP um, that enable, um, so the non-utilitarian forms of exclusions we've referenced. I'm just going to mention that the patent landscape is split on um, Truvada for um, PrEP, and there's an ongoing uh, lawsuit coupled with the possibility of evergreening. So um, the company has already another, a second generation drug, which is not very different from the first one in place, um, that's meant to capture the markets uh, once these patents are um, either invalidated uh, or they expire. Um, so the, the information we'd like to convey here is that the patent status of um, um, the protected status of the drug is likely to last uh, for a while, even though there is an ongoing patent um, dispute that might result in Gilead losing some um, um, protection, either um, through litigation or because uh, a very important uh, patent will expire next year. If I could get the next slide, please. Um, all right, actually, if I could go back uh, one slide, please. Um, that's that's just uh, our final, uh, our couple of final slides. Um, so what, what is the takeaway um, here? So th there's an intellectual property um, history um, here that uh, has been told in, in a number of uh, venues through which things like public money is funding research that's captured primarily by one player uh, in the private sector, which then can use uh, its bundle of uh, rights, uh, its intellectual property, um, to uh, act in certain ways in the marketplace. What we want to emphasize here is um, the less talked about connections between what this is doing from a market perspective and the colors in the graphics that we showed you uh, a moment ago. So if you think about uh, cost being the dominant factor in keeping indicated populations for PrEP uh, from um, accessing the drug, and if um, you think about where most of those um, populations live in the country. We have racial disparities at place um, here because it's primarily uh, Black and Latino populations that are being excluded from um, accessing um, this drug, and regional um, disparities um, as well, which we don't focus as much on uh, in our um, 
work um, here, but they map onto um, pretty closely onto the racial um, disparities. And, and this is what we mean by the non-utilitarian um, exclusion. This is uh, not what the company um, is trying um, to do, but this is a recurrent effect uh, of uh, allowing mechanisms like intellectual property um, to uh, work in the way they were um, designed to. You know, if I could get the last couple uh, of slides, I'll run through those. Um, quickly. So then, um, could, could you just go back to please? Sorry, that that one. Yes. So, all right. Um, I'll, I'll just point towards this. And uh, we're both happy to take questions on this during the Q&A. Um, we, we told you that, so we told you um, the story that illustrates claim number one. Uh, we're working on number two and number three now, but because they're so uh, important, we think to contextualize um, structural racism um, and intellectual property, in particular in, in this area, I'll just um, briefly nod at these two uh, areas. Um, um, we've mentioned FDA clearing um, through Vada for PrEP already, uh, and that's part of the intersectionality effects um, that we want um, to highlight and how those uh, further compound uh, manifestations of structural um, racism. So the fact that the FDA and Professor Yearby hinted at clinical trials and uh, other uh, forms of regulation um, that uh, are usually also linked to underrepresentation of racial uh, minorities, uh, we think all of that is also part uh, of this story. So next steps uh, for us uh, are to be mapping uh, in the context of uh, drugs coming uh, to market and access uh, to medicines to map these intersectionality effects, namely um, through um, FDA action uh, and what the agency has done or can do or should be doing uh, to potentially address uh, some of the problems we're diagnosing. Um, and then next slide, please. And then finally, um, the, the third thing that we think it's important to keep um, to help us keep exploring uh, manifestations of structural racism in, in this area is that the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical um, ecosystem depends also on representative to be beyond uh, clinical trials and access um, to, uh, to medicines. So recent um, studies have linked the current eligibility requirements at uh, the PTO um, to disparities in gender representation. Um, and we know those exist uh, also at the racial level. Again, happy to take questions um, about that. IP attorneys, you have the numbers uh, up there, but grossly, grossly uh, under representation of uh, non-white attorneys, particularly uh, in the tech intensive field that is IP. Um, same phenomenon, we are seeing that uh, amongst uh, patent um, holders. Uh, and finally, uh, CEO or high level positions in, in biotech or pharmaceutical um, companies also gross um, underrepresentation. Um, we are um, seeing uh, in this uh, ecosystem. So we call it an ecosystem um, in which there's a clockwork that's designed, uh, a legal system that's designed as the default um, avenue to promote uh, innovation. Um, there's a lot uh, out there mapping the utilitarian failures uh, of that um, system. We're trying to highlight the um, non-utilitarian um, failures that result um, in enabling and perpetuating manifestations of structural racism. Um, and um, Rukai, I don't know if you want to say something about the last slide in equity briefly, but I probably should stop in the interest of time. Um, yes, so I would just add here are some possible solutions which we can further discuss during uh, question and answer period, uh, but really trying to address the way uh, that the system is structured and think about ways to include equity, uh, which includes using equity impact assessments to think about how we move forward with patents. Um, so with that, I will stop and we look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Rushman and Yearby. Um, I mean, this is a, a really complicated uh, and complex area. I mean, when you describe it as an ecosystem, right, you think of all the different pieces of the ecosystem. So I really applaud you for, for starting to describe how all of these different parts interact with each other. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions now. A um, couple ways to ask questions. You can go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A function in chat. Um, if it's a short question or it's anonymous, I'll just read it myself. Um, if it's a longer question um, and it's not anonymous, then I can um, have you, the person who asked the question, just ask it um, themselves. So I'll unmute you and let you ask the question yourself. Um, you can also type questions in the chat, but really the easiest way is to just type it into the Q&A function in the webinar. Um, so while people are, are typing that, I have, I have one question just to get started on, which is, 
um, you show the maps and you and I talk about the cost differential. Um, do you have um, uh, do, do you identify at all the um, the lack of access to or lack of use of Truvada by different um, racial groups? Is there data on which racial groups are having access to it and which racial groups are not having access to it? Uh, yes, so um, there is data uh, on, on that and it's, um, so I think there's two basic um, distinctions. Uh, so Latino uh, and black populations are the ones that are affected um, the most and also rural populations uh, as opposed to urban uh, populations, except that in some places, including uh, Massachusetts, which I think Professor Yerby um, referenced um, here, uh, we also see some disparities even within uh, urban or suburban uh, areas, and, and some of those might affect um, white uh, populations and segments of the LGBTQ uh, population uh, as well. So there's much more granularity here than what we were able to convey um, in, in the allotted um, time. I think the, the main takeaway we wanted um, to um, um, to point towards um, today is this uh, idea that there is manifold forms of um, of disparity in terms of racial um, disparity. The recurring groups that we're seeing, you know, in many other contexts in, in the access to medicine uh, medicines movement, um, they are predominantly the ones that are the most affected um, here. With that, I would add addition to. to the LGBTQ um, group in, uh, in in some areas, both um, urban, uh, suburban, and um, um, and rural. This one that I have is, what is being done to improve underrepresentation of racial minorities in clinical trials? Is this problem getting better or becoming worse? Um, so I can speak to that. Uh, so traditionally, underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities participate in non-therapeutic clinical trials, so ones that are not going to result in a beneficial drug um, device, right? So more of the studies on is, um, is violence genetic. Um, and so you see a higher rate of racial and ethnic minorities participating in that. In terms of therapeutic trials, uh, which we're looking at, Right, the development of drugs and medical devices and procedures and practices, um, there still is a uh, dearth of, of racial and ethnic minorities for a whole host of reasons. Many of the clinical trials try to seek out people who are healthy and racial and ethnic minorities due to structural issues and lack of access to healthcare tend to be sicker and so are not um, always enrolled. Furthermore, uh, when we look at at sort of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many of the same institutions that are doing the trials have denied access to care for these racial and ethnic minorities. And so they are uh, less likely to sign up. And we can see this again, like I said, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as many racial and ethnic minorities have been turned away. And then these institutions are now seeking them out to participate in uh, clinical trials. And so no, it's not getting better because we're not fixing sort of the structural issues, increasing access to healthcare, but also building building the relationships that people need. Um, but I just want to highlight one last thing. Even if we increase access to clinical trials, we still need to look at the outside, I mean, the downstream impact, which is ensuring that once a clinical trial is over, that they actually have access to the medicines that are developed. And I would just quickly add to that that um, the case of COVID-19 vaccines is pretty illustrative of the phenomenon. Um, we are, and, and by we, I mean collectively, we're having trouble enrolling um, Black populations, for instance, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, in, for instance, who is running some uh, clinical trials here in St. Louis, and we're having trouble reaching South um, St. Louis, which, uh, again, uh, maps onto ongoing long-term disparities we, we've seen uh, racial and, and non-racial um, as well. And these, these are also the populations that are just now in polls indicating that they have no confidence in uh, the processes we're uh, going through right now to bring these vaccines um, to market. So that's going to further compound um, the effects of structural racism because these populations are losing faith in uh, the ways we're bringing these, um, these products to market.
And I would just add to that part of the issue, uh, including the trials here in St. Louis, is the, the way that the trials are structured and how they're trying to identify and work with populations. Again, not building that level of trust, not including members of the populations who are most impacted on their boards, not uh, working to undergo racial equity training uh, so that they could understand the disparities and the barriers that these people are suffering from. Um, and so, um, you know, that um, places a burden on being able to recruit people um, if you don't haven't built a relationship of trust and are only going after them to participate in vaccines, um, but not respecting them and partnering with them. Thank you. Um, here's a, a second question we have. Um, is it an inadvertent negative consequence of an act for a racial minority the same thing as structural racism? Oh, sorry, I misread that. Is an inadvertent negative consequence? Um... Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I hope that I'm answering this because I'm looking at the question as well. Um, when I think about structural racism, right, it's part of how we structure access um, to things. And so to me, it's not a negative unintended consequence. Um, if you structure access to healthcare based on ability to pay, um, it's not an unintended consequence that people who um, don't have access to health insurance, uh, who tend to be in low wage jobs, who tend to be racial and ethnic minorities, um, don't have this access to healthcare, um, don't have access to medicines. Um, will I, what I will say is that it, it appears neutral, right? That many of the structures and how we set them up do not mention race, um, but do have this consequence. Um, I would say it is not unintended that we have structured our systems to um, particularly patents medicine in a way that only those who can afford it can get it. Um, so I hopefully am answering the question. Um, it's neutral, um, but not an unintended consequence. And I, I would add to that um, a complementary angle, which is the structure from an innovation policy perspective that we have in place and that's so heavily reliant on uh, patents um, has had two great moments in um, history. So the late 19th century when intellectual property was born and then sort of, you know, the checkpoint in the 90s, right? So 94, when we ossify some of the structures we, we had and some of those things were good that we ossified them, but there was a deliberate um, design um, component at, at the time and we chose to reinforce structures that had been in uh, place. We had seen the growth of the pharmaceutical industry um, throughout the 20th century, and then even biotech, right? When you get to the 90s, we have about two decades of um, experience with uh, uh, biotech. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the design decisions that uh, were made back in the 90s that are largely responsible uh, for the IP structure that we are um, arguing, uh, compounds, reinforces um, structural uh, racism, um, some of that might not have been um, deliberate. Um, we're not suggesting um, that uh, it, it was deliberate, but when you move from deliberation to, you know, not intending um, certain types of exclusions and not foreseeing that those exclusions are predominantly uh, race-based in many contexts, we think that's a, that is something that um, did happen. And that structure is around uh, innovation systems, FDA uh, approval, rewards set at FDA level, like vouchers or market exclusivities, they reinforce that. When, when in uh, the context of the ACA negotiations, uh, we decide that the longest period of market exclusivity that we're going to attach to a drug, so these emerging drugs, biologics, uh, is going to be 12 years, that's another form of exclusion. So we're systematically choosing the same mechanism, different guises, but same mechanisms. And uh, we think that there's, again, not necessarily um, deliberate in, in the sense we want to exclude these populations, but you can't um, you think, um, argue that this is not a foreseeable um, consequence um, in the 90s. Uh, We have time for one more question. Um, this one's from uh, Shuba Ghosh. Uh, Shuba, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Professor Zerbi and, and, and Anna for a great presentation. It uh, covers a lot and 
I wish you had, uh, we had more time to talk, I'll answer, ask my question very quickly. Uh, so people have written uh, about patent pledges uh, that have been uh, uh, entered into voluntarily, I think, some in the telecom area, and there may be in other sectors as well, I think pharma as well. Uh, do you think the USPTO should require a, um, that, uh, that patent owners engage in equitable distribution of their patented invention, you know, whatever the sector might be as a condition of the patent grant. Uh, so um, just as background, uh, you know, in the real property area, uh, you know, there's been work by, 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 by Professor Singer and others to talk about, um, you know, the public dimension of property. Uh, but, and, you know, the, in the 90s, uh, there was you know, a lot of literature in the land use area that, that looked at this in the context of exactions. I don't think those, those issues in, in the takings context of exactions map on to the patent area exactly in terms of um, constitutional issues. So I don't think the constitutional issues are surmountable. I think it's largely a, a policy decision rather than a constitutional limitation. So I wondered if you would add that to the list of, of policies, just a, just a straight out condition from the, from the agency that we've, we've given you this grant and now we want you to make sure you, 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 you exercise those exclusionary rights in an equitable way. So what are your thoughts about that? So maybe I can uh, begin um, by answering um, this one. Uh, first, hi, it's good um, to see you. And then um, two, it, it's an interesting um, solution. We've seen uh, in the context of um, COVID, professors Contreras and Lemley um, designing um, the open pledge, which um, seems especially well-suited uh, for situations of uh, intense need and compressed timelines as the ones we're facing um, today. I like um, your um, a proposal. Um, I have some, and, and I think uh, probably Professor Irby as well, we have some question marks about applying it in a more transversal um, way. First, um, it, it's not that the way, you know, from the constitutional um, clause um, to uh, several uh, laws uh, mentioning um, the public interest uh, in say, you know, the tech transfer provisions in the patent act and the like. It, it's not that the idea of, um, equity and equitable access is necessarily absent from our um, laws. So I can see that there's a legal structure in place um, through which we can argue that actually ought to be a requirement, right? Um, I, I don't think that under current um, case law and our regulatory approach, actually, we could um, implement that uh, requirement and expect it to go unchallenged. And I think it would probably not be uh, upheld, but would it be desirable? Um, yes, given the political um, economy, I think one thing to keep in mind is that who pays the fees for the PTO um, to uh, work the way it does. It's uh, largely um, the same people who are getting, uh, you know, patents at, at the end of the day. So I, I'm not entirely sure that much as I like that suggestion, that I think it's, uh, it's something we can consider transversely. Now, if we start talking about are there certain categories of goods and might not even necessarily be all types of health goods, uh, again, because political economy and uh, several other constraints, but can we start, um, you know, hacking away at the problem uh, by saying there are some particular types of goods and, um, you know, if, if I may, a quick side note, I've said, you know, vaccines might be that type of goods, but by no means the only ones that, um, and Professor Alderson, for instance, has said there's something special about antimicrobial resistance. Are there some types of goods that we should be talking about in a differentiated way? And then we could attach those kinds of requirements in ways we might not do um, elsewhere. I, I think that that's an excellent idea. Well, I know our time is short, so I'll defer to that answer. Well, thank you both for joining us, for sharing your thoughts on, on the ecosystem. And I, I look forward to hearing more about the, the ecosystem structure that you're describing here. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, so thank you all. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us uh, today. Uh, we have our, our next speaker in two weeks um, when uh, Tabrez uh, Abrahim talks about issues uh, relating to artificial intelligence.
Um, and if you're around next Friday, um, the Iowa Law Review Symposium on the Future of Law and Transportation, um, we're co-sponsoring that symposium, and there's an absolutely terrific slate of speakers. Uh, you can find out more details on the IBL's webpage, um, but you might want to check it out if you're interested in law and transportation. Um, and with that, I'll say goodbye to everyone. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you all soon again. Bye-bye. <laughs>